Mar, uh, Prof. Ito. <laughs> we, uh, do you hear yeah, me? We think, yeah, we think for the, the other students maybe. Dustin, do you hear me? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yes, yes, Prof. Oh. Ito. We can yes. hear
Oke, okay, uh, Dr. Neneng. I think time is uh, <coughs> nine o'clock Western Indonesian time. We can start now. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this lecture entitled Descriptive Statistic. Insya Allah, uh, would be heard by Prof. Dr. Hito Hito Kyoshi, Kyosu. I'm sorry, from Melaka Manipal Medical College, Melaka, Malaysia. This lecture is a collaboration of the Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta, <coughs> and Melaka Manipal Medical College, MMMC, Melaka, Malaysia. Let me introduce myself. My name Burhan Din Ihsan. I'm from Universitas Muhammadiyah Surakarta, from Department of Public Health and Family Medicine. And I will be serving as moderator today in this lecture. First of all, I would like to say that all price belongs to Allah. And we do not forget to send salawat and salam to our Lord, the Prophet of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has led mankind from ignorant life to civilization that is full of life. And uh, I would like to thank to Prof. Dr. Hito Hito Kiyosu. Good morning, Prof. Welcome Good morning. to Surakarta virtually as guest lecturer. And all participants from lecture, students from Malaysia and from Indonesia for joining to this lecture. Um, before we start the presentation of uh, from Prof. Dr. Hito Hito Kyosu, I'd like to read the screen of this lecture. Uh, this lecture would be divided into four sessions, opening and then presentation, discussion and closing. <clears throat> and I would like to read the rules in this lecture for participants Um, microphone be mute please but um, camera be on please and in the discussion session participant can directly ask to uh, Prof Hito uh, and now I would like to invite Prof Hito Hito Kyosu to present her lecture Uh, but uh, I think I'd like to read her curriculum vitae first. Prof. Dr. Hito Hito Kiyosu, Education, PhD, Public Health, College of Public Health Sciences, Tulalangkon, University, Thailand, Master of Public Health, College of Public Health Sciences, Sulalangkon University, Thailand, and Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery, MBBS University of Medicine One, Myanmar. Contact information, Melaka Manipal Medical College, Muar Campus, Jalan Kesang, Taman Segamat Muar, 8400 Johor, Malaysia. And professional experience, Professor from April 2018 until present at Melaka Manipal Medical College, Melaka, Malaysia. And uh, she is consultant in three countries, I think, at Malaysia, at uh, Myanmar, and at Thailand. Uh, uh, this is uh, extraordinary, Prof. <laughs> And uh, her research, wow, 
in many reputation international journal 54 publication in international journal alhamdulillah I think uh, I would not like to read all of the curriculum vitae because the long of <laughs> so I uh, know I think time is just profit to present the presentation please thank you thank you so much uh, good morning uh, everyone First of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, University Muhammadiyah Surakarta, UMS, for inviting us to give this uh, public health lecture series. So we are very happy to share our knowledge with the students and as well as the faculty members from UMS. And also I, I am very thankful for sharing our middle keys to our students. And I am sure that that will be very, uh, very beneficial for um, uh, Malacca Manipur Medical College students uh, as well for their learning purpose. And today uh, is the last lecture for uh, quantitative sciences in public health series. And then I'm going to talk about uh, descriptive statistics uh, in this uh, lecture series. So these are the learning outcomes for today's lecture. So at the end of uh, this lecture, the student will understand how to organize and how to displace appropriately uh, for the data that they collect. And they will also understand how to use the descriptive measures to summarize to the information. And also they will know that how to calculate the measure of self-dependency and the measure of dispersions that is in the descriptive statistics. So the first, why we need this uh, statistic, especially why we need biostatistics, the data are everywhere. So there are many uh, diseases, many health related problems in the community. Like whenever we talk about the disease, we cannot simply say that they are the disease based people or that they are the patients, that they are the people who suffer the, let's say like lung cancer or the breast cancer or the uh, hypertension or diabetes. We cannot simply say that we always need to talk about the magnitude of the health problem or the magnitude of the diseases. So like, for example, like the prevalence incidences, we need to talk, then people will understand, especially the health policy makers and the administrators, they will understand about the impact of the health problems in the community. So as you can see that in this uh, literature here, sorry, Okay, data are utilized and then they are summarized very frequently in the research literature. So this is a research article published in the archives of surgery. And then you can see that the researcher presented the, the, the data here, the mortality rate and also the morbidity, that is the stroke rate, and then the length of the stay and then the cost and showing the, whether the hypothesis is supported or not. And another one here, that is in the media. This data is presented, uh, was presented by CNN. So you can see that with one third of the US children overweight and about 70% was obese. So this one, this data highlight the magnitude of the childhood obesity and then that call for the action, that call for the intervention, the public intervention for prevention of this health problem. Not only that here, many media like Washington Post here they also presented the data about the HIV infection. The number of young homosexual men being newly diagnosed with HIV infection is rising by 12% a year. And then this steepest upward trend in young black men. So this data highlight about the high risk population and also this call for the action. And then recently, I'm sure that many of you are aware that Pfizer pharmaceutical company they made the press release and then they say that COVID-19 vaccine, they found that it is effective. But in that press release, they stated that it is the vaccine efficacy is 90%. So these are the data. We cannot avoid it. Data are everywhere. So we need to understand about how to summarize, how to organize this data to get the useful information. So there are two types of the data there, good data and then bad data. So when we do the research, we will get one of that. So you can look at this example. For example, I, I want to conduct 
the research. The objective is to know about the stress level among the medical students. So my population here is the MBBS students. So in the MBBS students, let's say in my campus, there are 1,000 plus students are there. So I cannot take all of the students in my research. So what I decide is I'm going to take the sample. So here I'm taking the sample of 100 students and then these are the final year students that I take that, take that. And then I distribute the questionnaire, for example, like dust skill, depression, stress, anxiety skill to measure the stress level. Then I calculate the prevalence. Then I found that the prevalence of the high stress is 70%. That's me out of 100, 70% of the students are having high stress and the moderate stress is 30%. But here, the problem is these are the final year students. And then I did this study during October, 2020. So last month, they are having the university exam. Then their stress level is high. And in my sample, I included only one academic year, that is the final year, and then why they are having the university examination. So these samples are not the representative sample. The bias here is called selection bias. This is the bad data. We can analyze, we can summarize, and then we get the information about prevalence of high stress is 70% and the moderate is 30% but which is not true, right? So this is a bad data, but it will give us the incorrect information only. So instead of taking only one academy here, what I need to do is I have to take the random sample. So I use a simple random sampling and then I take the random sample in that random sample that include all academy years from first year to the final year. So this is a good data. Then I can analyze, I can summarize, but the information that I will get is a useful information. So whenever we conduct the research, we always need to know that we need to have the good data. So how to get the good data? We cannot rely only on the statistic. When you plan the study, you need to plan about your study population. You need to plan about uh, your sample size, how many people you are going to take. You need to plan about your data collection too. It should be valid, it should be reliable. Then we will get the correct information. We will get the good data, okay? So this is the steps that involve in the research project. Statistics is not only coming to the data analysis part. So when you plan and when you design for the study that we need to understand about the statistic, like depends on the objective, we choose the appropriate study design. It can be cross-sectional or case control or cohort study. Depends on our objective, we select that. Then we need to think about our study population. And then we set the inclusion criteria, inclusion uh, exclusion criteria. Then. Usually the study population is a very big one, right? We don't have enough time and enough resources. So what we are doing is we are taking the subset, that is the sample. So if you decide to take the sample, how many people we need, that is the sample size calculation. The statistic is coming. We need to set the appropriate level of type one error, type two error, and then we need to use the appropriate literature. Then we can calculate the sample size. That is the statistic here. The sample size formulas are there, right? And also the many sample size uh, applications and the software are there. We can use that. We will know how many people we need. Then after that, we need to think, how are we going to take this sample from the big population? This is the sampling. There are probability sampling methods and the non-probability sampling methods. So which one we are going to take? Which one is the appropriate one and the suitable for our study? Then when we collect the data, we need to think about reliability and the validity of your data collection too. It should be valid. It should be reliable. If you use a questionnaire also, your questionnaire must be valid and then reliable as well. So if you develop the new questionnaire, we need to check for the validity. So we can check for the content validity, face validity, and also we can calculate the Cronbach's alpha coefficient to know about the internal consistency of your questionnaire as well. Then we analyze the data. So then the statistic is coming here and then we can organize, we can summarize, and then we will get the information that we interpret that. And if we are having the hypothesis, we can test the significance of the data and like we are testing the hypothesis as well. So the statistic involves us summarizing the data that we collect from the sample, right? So this is the descriptive statistic. We take the sample, we collect the data, and then we summarize this data from the sample. This is a descriptive statistic. But the another one is these samples are coming from the big population. So always we want to know that what is happening in the big population, the study population. So we are going to make an inference to the big population of 
all the population here. So this is that we are making the inference. This is we call the inferential statistic. Statistic is applied in many fields, like can be in the business statistic, economic statistic, in the education, in physics, in engineering. And the statistic here that we use for the biological and the medical science is called the biostatistic or the medical statistic. It's also known as the biometry, that is the measurement of life. So the statistic is used to study the disease. We can know the prevalence, incidence of the disease. We can also study about the risk factors or the determinants of the disease. We can know the effectiveness, efficiency, efficacy of the drug, of the vaccine, or the, of any of the preventive and control programs that we can study that. We can use a statistic. And not only that, we can use statistics to predict for the future. What will be the trend? It will be the increasing trend or the decreasing trend for the policymaker. And the, another statistic here, right, in the public health is vital statistic that is related to the demography or the births, deaths, fertility indicators or the mortality indicators. So this is the statistics. So what is data? Data are the raw material of the statistic. We can get the data through the observation or we can make the measurement like height, weight or the blood pressure. We can measure, we will get the data or we can also get the data from the interaction. That is like we... Uh, do the interview and are uh, using the questionnaire, then we will get the data. So this is a raw material only, right? For example, let's say in the, uh, among the students, right? Medical students, I want to know about the smoking status. So whether the individual student, they are the smoker or that they are not smoker, this is the raw material only. It doesn't give us any information, right? The first student, let's say student A, smoker, student B, not smoker, student C, smoker, student D, a smoker. So it is the raw material. We don't get information. So what we need to do, we are going to summarize this data to get the information is we calculate how many of the students are the smoker and then we calculate the prevalence. That is the percentage. This is the information. Let's say, yes, in the medical students, among the medical students, 30% of the students are the smoker. This is more than the national level. So this is like, it's very alarming. So we need to use, we need to propose to the policymaker or the health administrator to initiate any of the preventive and control interventions. So this is here, the, so this is we call the data-driven decision-making. Whatever the policymaker or the health administrators or the healthcare partners want to uh, intervene or want to initiate any public health intervention, we need to use the data. So this is the data and the variables, right? There are many different types of the data or the variables. The first one, variables. Variable means characteristic. They can be varied from person to person. The data and the variable, right? When we classify that, it's the same, but the data is the actual measurement. So for example, let's say, I want to know about the gender of the student. Gender is the characteristic. They can be varied from student to student. Gender, whether the student is male or female. This is the actual measurement. This is data. Like height. It's the characteristic that is a variable, but the students is having height of 180 centimeter, 165 centimeter. This is the actual measurement. This is data. So this data or the variables can be classified into two types, qualitative data and quantitative data. So qualitative data are the categorical data, categorical variables. So in the categorical variables that we cannot measure this variable, like gender, we cannot measure the gender, but we can count. How many male, how many female are they? By ethnicity, the same. We cannot measure the ethnicity, but we can count the frequency. How many Malay, how many Chinese, how many Indians are they? So this is the qualitative categorical data. Another one is the quantitative numerical data. In the quantitative numerical data, we can measure the variables and also we can count. Like height, that we can measure 160, 180, 165 centimeter, right? Or weight. 50 kg, 51, 52 kg, that we can measure that. And also we can count how many people are, uh, are having weight of uh, 50 kg, 55 kg there. So we can count as well. So this is the quantitative data. So in the qualitative data, we can subclassify into dichotomous and nominal and then ordinal. And in the quantitative data, we can classify as discrete and continuous variable. So the first one here, nominal. Nominal variable, they are the qualitative categorical data. This is the n-order categories. Only name is there. We cannot say who is better than uh, who. 
So there are other categories, for example, like uh, ethnicity, Malay, Chinese, Indian, and others here in Malaysia. We cannot say who is the best, who is the lowest. We cannot say that, right? And the blood group, A, B, A, B, O, we cannot say who is the best. And the marital status, we cannot say single is the best, right? So single, married, divorce, or the widow, we cannot say who is higher, who is the best, who is the lowest. We cannot say that. This is a nominal verb. Only name is there. We cannot rank that. The another one is an ordinal categorical, but we can rank. Which one is the highest? Which group is the lowest one? For example, like cancer staging, stage one, two, three, four, which one highest? Stage four is the highest. Which one is lowest? Stage one is the lowest one. Or educational level, illiterate, primary, secondary, or the high school education. Which one highest? High school is the highest education. And then the lowest category is the illiterate. This is the ordinal variable. The another one in the category of data is the dichotomous and the polychotomous. Dichotomous are having two categories only. That is the present absence of the disease or death, alive or smoker, non-smoker. This is a dichotomous binary data. Another one is a polychotomous. It's a non-binary. It is the three or more categories. For example, like nationality, ethnicity, like Malay, Chinese, Indian, others, or the blood group AB, ABO, four categories are there. This is a polychotomous data. In the quantitative numerical data, we can classify into discrete and then continuous. Discrete variable. That is a gap or the interruption between the value, right? For example, like a uh, number of children, a number of siblings, right? How many siblings you have? Zero, one, two, three, four. No one is having 1.5 siblings, right? No value is between one and two, two and three. So this is the discrete variable. That is a whole value, integer value only. Another one is a continuous data. That continuous variable lie on the continuum so that that can take any value between two specified value, two specified limits. For example, like the weight, right? 50 and 51 kg. They can be the person having 50.1 kg, 50.2 kg, 15.3 kg. So that is the continuous data that we can, depends on the accuracy of the measurement too. We can measure that. Let's say 50.1, 50.5 kg. But if you can, if you can measure very specifically like, it can be 50.1235 kg or so. So there is no gap between the unit. This is a continuous variable, like high weight, right? Or BMI, this is a continuous data. So another one is in our research, we can also uh, classify the variables as an independent variable. These are the explanatory variable or the exposure. And then dependent variable, these variables are also called as outcome variable. And then they can be the control variable. That is the confounding factor. That is the extraneous variable. The confounding variables are related to the independent variable. And then these are influencing the occurrence of the outcome or the dependent variables. The another one depends on the objectivity and the subjectivity. Then we can say that hard variable and then soft variable. Hard variable are the objective variable right, that we can measure and then we will get this variable. But the soft variable is we rely on the, the participants, right, so what they say, that is the subjective variable. For example, like happiness or the satisfaction or the pain, this one is the subjective variables. Like objective variable is like what we measure, like high weight, right, or like uh, serum cholesterol level, age. So this is the objective data. So I explained already, right? Variables are the characteristic that can be vary from person to person. So in the research, right, it is very important for us to identify the variables before you collect the data. So it can avoid the unnecessary uh, collection of the data. And then also it will make sure that we will collect only the relevant data to our objective. If we want to know about the smoking among the medical students, so we need to ask about like whether the students smoke or not, right? How many cigarettes and then how did, when did they start smoking? All this related to the smoking that we can ask about, uh, we can ask that. But like, how about alcohol drinking or the drug use? So this is not relevant, right, to our objective. So like that, we need to identify what variables that we need to include, like independent, dependent variable, we have to prepare the conceptual framework. Then after that, we can start, collect, we can start preparing our data collection tool, and then we should collect the data. So the variables is a characteristic, but the data is the actual measurement. As I explained earlier, 
variables, for example, like age is a variable, that's a characteristic. Like the person is 18 years old, 19 years old. This is the data, this is the actual measurement. So in the statistic that we calculate two statistics, the one is the descriptive statistic, another one is the inferential statistic. Descriptive statistic is we summarize and we organize the data that we collect from the sample. So this is the descriptive statistic. But the inferential statistic, always we are taking the subset, the sample from the big population. The aim of many research, right, is to know about this study population. So if you want to estimate about the study population, that is we call the inferential statistic. So you can look at it here, right? This is the real world, this is the population here. If you can take everyone and then you study the population that you will get the fact. But most of the research, we don't have enough time or the enough resources to take all people or all individuals in the population. So what we do, we are going to take only the subset, that is the sample. Then we collect the data from the sample. And if you describe, if you summarize, organize the data about data from the sample, this is we call the descriptive statistic. Then we make the conclusion based on our descriptive statistic. And then if you generalize this conclusion to the real world, to the big population, the study population, this is we call the inferential statistic. So here in the biostatistic, there are two statistics we calculate. The first one, descriptive statistic, what we do. The first, we can, alter, we can make altering into the distribution. For example, like age distribution of the disease, gender distribution of the disease, we can make that. Or another one is we can draw the graphs or that we can prepare the table and then we can summarize to the information as well. Later on, I will explain about this. And the next one is we can also calculate about we got uh, one number, right, to describe the whole data set. That is, we call the measure of center tendency and measures of dispersion. The another one is the inferential statistic. In the inferential statistic, two things that we do. The first one is we are going to estimate the parameter. So estimation of the parameter, what we calculate is the 95% confidence interval that we are calculating, and then we want to know about what is the uh, happening in the study population. For example, let's say I want to know about the prevalence of smoking among the students, among MBBS students. The study population is 1,000 students are there. I take the subset, the sample of 100, and then I study the prevalence in that 100. But then my aim is not to know about this 100. My aim is to know about the 1,000 students, what is happening. So based on the sample data of 100 students' data, then I can calculate the 95% conference interval, which is estimating about the steady population. What about the prevalence in the big population there? Okay. The another one is a hypothesis testing. In the research, right, there are many different study designs are there. If you do the analytical study design, analytical observational study, like cross-section analytical or the case control cohort study, or if you do the randomized control trial, whenever you are comparing between the groups, we have the hypothesis. So this hypothesis can be tested. So that is under the inferential statistic. Hypothesis testing is not to know about our sample. In our sample, whether the people, the groups are different or not, we will know that. But hypothesis testing is to understand about the study population. So today I'm going to explain about descriptive statistic. So here descriptive statistic, what we do is we summarize, we organize, we simplify the data that we collect from the sample. Okay? So we can prepare the tables, we can prepare the graph to understand about the data. And also we can uh, provide the numerical summary measures. That is, we are calculating the central tendency and the dispersion. So you can look at this uh, first example here. So this is about the Kaposi sarcoma for the 2,568 patients in Atlanta. So this is the, the raw data here. So zero stands for absence of the disease and then one stands for the presence of the disease. So zero and one, this is a raw data here, right? When you look at the raw data, we don't understand at all, right? So how many are having Kaposi sarcoma? How many are not that we cannot understand? So what we do? So the first one is we need to count, right? It's a very simple thing. We need to count and then we can pre present about the absolute frequency. How many of the patients with AIDS are having Kaposi sarcoma here? It's out of 2560, 246 are having Kaposi sarcoma and then 2314 are not having Kaposi sarcoma. So this is the dichotomous data. So in the dichotomous data is the present absence of the disease. What we can present, what we can calculate for the descriptive statistic is that frequency. Absolute frequency we can calculate, okay? So another one, this is a serum cholesterol level. Serum cholesterol is a quantitative continuous variable. For the continuous 
uh, variable. How we summarize? The first one, we can make into the categories. We can categorize. So that is that we make into the non-overlapping class interval of equal class size here. This is not overlap or the class interval. And then this is the equal class size here. It is about, it is the 39, right? 39 milligram per hand drop made. So this is the equal class size. And then we can simply count that how many people, how many men in each of the category, in each of the serum cholesterol level. This is the absolute frequency only. The another one, we always calculate absolute frequency and then relative frequency together. The relative frequency is a percentage. So like this example, you can look at that. There are the two population here, that age of 25 to 34 men and then age of 55 to 64 men, right? This is the absolute frequency. We just simply count how many men in each of the serum cholesterol level. And then we also can calculate about relative frequency. This is the percentage. So it's very easy to calculate the percentage, right? For example, like 80 to 119 is 13 over 1067. And then we present percentage here is 1.2%. So the second uh, uh, serum cholesterol level, second category is 120 to 159 is 150 men are there. So 150 divided by 1067, which is 14.1%. Like so this is a relative frequency percentage we calculate together. So whenever we present for the uh, uh, categorical variable qualitative data, right? Like dichotomous or it can be polychotomous or nominal or ordinal. The first we can present the frequency. We can calculate the frequency. That is the absolute frequency. And the another one is we calculate the relative frequency. That is the percentage. So here relative frequency are very good. Especially if you want to compare the two population which is having the different size uh, or the different sample size or different population size. If you compare that, the relative frequency is very useful here. So you can look at the age 25 to 34 here, right? So serum cholesterol level less than 200, that is the healthy cholesterol level is like more than half of the participants, right? But in age 55 to 64, it's healthy cholesterol level is about one fourth, it's about 25% of the participants only, right? So that's relative frequency is a very useful one. So we always calculate frequency together with the percentage, absolute frequency and relative frequency. This is for the categorical data. And if you collect the quantitative continuous data also, if you categorize that, we can calculate absolute and the relative frequency. The another one is the graphs, right? The graphs, there are many different types of the graphs, depends on the type of the variable, we can present, we can use the appropriate graphs. So the first one is the histogram. Histogram is used for the quantitative continuous variable, right? So here, this is the histogram showing about the height of 106 women. And then this is the single variable, only that height in centimeter, right? So horizontal AC is the height, that is the variable here. And then the vertical AC here is the frequency. Then we can look at that. This one can show as the highest frequency, which is the 160 to 165 centimeter. That is the highest frequency. And also we can know about the shape of the distribution. So here the shape here, right? It will be like a little bit skewed to the left and then whether it is the symmetrical or not, it is a bell shaped curve or not. In statistic, the bell shaped curve, which is called normal distribution is a very important, right? For, especially for the, the statistical calculation, the probability calculation. The another one is the bar chart. So the bar chart, right? Here the bar chart is that there is a gap or the interruption between the, the block here. So the bar chart is used for the discrete variable or general variable, and then it can also be used for nominal variable as well. So this example is about the ordinal data. There are three categories, good health, fairly good health, and then not good health. So in this one, we can use the bar chart to present about this. So here, the same thing, horizontal AC is the categories here, and then vertical AC here, right? Y AC here is the frequency. The another one is a box plot, also known as a box and whisker plot. It is also used for the quantitative continuous data. And then this is a box plot presenting the single variable, which is the height in centimeter. So in this one, there are 37 um, uh, nine manual workers and then height here. So this is a box plot is presenting the five number summary, which is here is the uh, third quartile, right? This one is the first quartile. And then this is the median value right here. The box is presenting the middle 50%. And then you can see that this is called whisker and then it is connected to the lowest value and then the largest value, right? So this is the box can whisker plot, box plot. Also the box plot is presenting about 
the location of the concentration and then whether the data is symmetrical or not as well. So in that one, right, we can see that the median value is around like 164, 165. So that we can say that 50%, right, of the sample, they are less than or equal to 60, uh, 165 centimeters. So that we can understand from the box plot. The another one is the pie chart. Pie chart is used for the nominal variable, right? When you draw the pie chart, the categories, right, the number of the categories should be minimum of three and the maximum of 10. So if you have like two categories, for example, like gender, we cannot draw pie chart, right? It's not appropriate one. So in this example, you can see that is the animal used in the research, right? In the Czech Republic in 2015, then you can see that this is like the total of one, two, three, four, five categories are there. So when we draw the pie chart, we always start from the 12 o'clock position, from the largest proportion to the smallest one. If you have the others category, others should be the last one. So when you total up, it should be 100%, right? It should be the, uh, the, the uh, sum of the, all the frequency, it should be the total, okay? And then sometimes, right, you will have like the, the categories, but all are the same frequency or the same percentage. For example, like there are the five categories and each category is like 20%. So the pie chart is not appropriate for this. So I have already explained about the first one is the, uh, the tables, right? Then we can prepare the tables uh, for presenting the frequency and then percentage for the dichotomous and the polychotomous and nominal and ordinal data. And when you are having the continuous variable that we can also present about uh, frequency and percentage as well. Then the another one is a different type of the graphs also like used to summarize the data to uh, get the useful information. Now I'm going to the third part, which is the numerical summary measures. So there are two measures uh, in the descriptive statistic. That is the measure of sample tendency, which is presenting about the center of the data set, right? And then another one is a measure of dispersion that is presenting about the spread of the data set, okay? The sample tendency is the middle of your distribution, middle of the data set. That is like we are calculating the, the single score and then describe the entire data. So there are three measures of sample tendency which is the mean, median, and mode. Mean is the average, right? We add all value and then divide it by total sample size and we will get the mean. And the median, we need to arrange into the ascending order. The median is the middle value, right? And then the mode is the most frequently occurring value. It is very easy to calculate for all these three measures of sample tendency. The first one is the mean. Here that we are calculating it is the arithmetic mean. So that is the same as the average, right? We add all together, we add all value together, all observation together, that is a summation of X divided by N, okay? So if you are calculating the population mean, so in the population, uh, you are calculating the mean, the here we denote uh, by mu, and then if you are taking the subset sample, and then if you calculate the mean, the here we denote by X bar. Okay, so here the mean is calculated for the quantitative variable. So for example, like BMI, height, weight, right? We can calculate mean. So for example, here, there are nine people. The sample size here is nine. We randomly select and then we ask for how many pairs of shoes they have. So this is the response here is one, three, five, four, three, seven, two, eight, three. So we want to calculate the mean. So what we do, we add all the value here or observation together. We add summation of all this. Divided by total sample size is nine, that is a uh, four shoes. So the means is very easy to calculate, right? And easy to understand the average of the data. And the uniqueness in the one data set, that is only one mean is there. But the limitation here, mean is influenced by outliers. If you have the extreme data, mean is affected. For example, let's say I want to calculate the uh, age, mean age of the class. The mean age of the class the age is like the student's age is around like let's say 21, 22, 23. If I get if I calculate the mean, the mean also will be like around 21 point something or 20 point something only, right? But if you take the lecturer and then you calculate the mean, the lecturer, let's say if the lecturer is like 50 years old, 55 years old, the mean will be affected, right? So this is the limitation. And also another one is mean cannot be calculated for the nominal and ordinal data. Gender, we cannot calculate the mean. And then uh, education, we cannot calculate the mean as well. So this is the same as the previous example. Instead of the last person right here is the 48 pairs of shoes. This is the extreme data, this is the outliers. So when you calculate the mean here, mean is nine shoes. So mean is affected by the outliers. 
So the another one is the median, right? The second measures here. The median, we need to arrange into the ascending order for the data set. Then median is the middle value, right? So this is the same as the 58th percentile. So in this one, the median formula is M plus one over two, right? But some of the textbook, they say that median, right? There are the two formulas there. It can be the odd number or the even number the data set is. If the odd number is N plus one by two, but the even number is N over two, and then plus N over two plus one, and then we take the average of this. So whatever the formula, it's the calculation is the same. Okay, the, the answer will be the same. So you can look at this example. So there are the total of uh, seven, right? Uh, observation here in this data set. So the first thing is we need to arrange into the ascending order. So from the minimum value to the maximum value here, and then we calculate the median, which is the M plus one over two is seven plus one divided by two, which is the fourth item. So we look at the data is one, two, three, four, four item is a seven, okay? So then we can say that 50% of the data or the half of the data is below the median and the half of the data is above the median value. The another one is the even number sample size. So even number sample size in this data set is the eight, right? The observation here, the eight, the, uh, eight observations are there. So M plus one over two is eight plus one divided by two, which is a 4.5. So the 4.5 is the fourth item and the fifth item is the middle uh, uh, way of this two fold and the fifth item. So we can take the average of these two. So seven plus eight divided by two, which is a 7.5 is the median. So we can say that the 50% of the data is less than or equal to this 7.5. So the same, like me, in one data set, there is only one median. It's a uniqueness. And then it's very easy to calculate and easy to understand. It is the 50th percentile, right? It's the, the middle value, the 50% below and 50% above the median value. And then when you have the outliers of the extreme data, median is not affected. Because median is we calculate based on the location, based on the sample size, and then we look at the location there. So whatever like we are having the extreme data, the median will be affected. Mean is affected because mean calculation is we use all the actual observation. So mean is affected by the extreme data. So the median is used for the skew data. If your observation, right, if your data set is the right skew, the positive skew or the left skew, the negative skew data, then we better present the median. And if you have the ordinal numerical data, for example, like the Likert scale of one to five, then we better present the median, okay? But the cons here, if you have the normally distributed data, normal distribution, if your the data is like a pear shaped curve, then we present the mean. Mode is the most frequently occurring value in our data set. That's a peak, right? So in this data set, seven occurs two times. So this is set, uh, um, the mode here is a seven. This is we call unimodal one mode. So in this data set, seven occurs three times, eleven occurs three times. This is two modes by modal. Sometimes multimodals, many modes, or sometimes no modes at all. No modes mean that's all the value occurs in the same frequency. Right? So then no modes at all. So here, mode is also easy to calculate, and but mode can be applied to all type of the data. Even though nominal, ordinal, dichotomous data, mode can be applied. For example, like gender, male and female, which one is higher frequency that we can say that which one is the higher percentage that is the mode. So we can apply to all type of the data. And the mode is not affected by the outliers as well, okay? But the limitation here, the cons here is, if it is a normal distribution, mean is the one, the central tendency that we use to present, but the median it mode is not, uh, not presented in the normal distribution. So in this example, we randomly select the nine people and then we ask about the age. So this is the response here, right? So the first thing is what we need, we need to arrange into ascending order. So from the minimum, right, the smallest value to the largest value, we arrange into the ascending order. So we can calculate the mean, median, and mode here. So the mean is at all value, right, all observation divided by total sample size, which is nine, we will get mean. In this data set, what is median value? Can anyone answer? What is median? Anyone? Uh, and it might be middle value. Middle value. So what is the middle value here? 28. 28, yes. So here the median is, the formula is M plus one over two, right? So 
And its sample size is nine. So nine plus one over two, which is the fifth item here. So one, two, three, four, five here. This is 28. So what about mole? 28 two. 28, yes. Mole is also 28, right? The mean is at all value divided by total number of the observation here. Mean is 28.77, okay? So in this data set, the last person is 33 years old, but we wrongly recorded as 83. What do you think? What will happen to our mean? Mm. It will be increased or decreased? Of course, increased. Of course, increased. Yes, it will be increased, right? So what about median here in this data set? What about median? 28. 28, correct. The sample size is still nine, right? So median is the 28. Is the fifth item here is 28. What about mode? Mode is almost 28. Mode is also 28, also right? So in this one, you can see that one, there is an outlier of the extreme data. Mean is affected, but the median is mode is not affected by the outliers, okay? So these are the measure of sample tendency, which is mean, median, and mode. Okay, now I'm going for the next one. Okay, look at that one. This is the normal, uh, sorry, the histogram and the frequency polygon, right? Showing about the distribution of the quantitative continuous data. For example, like your exam marks. Your exam marks is the quantitative data, right? The continuous data. So we can draw the histogram and then this is a frequency polygon showing the distribution here. So in that one, the center, this is the mean, right? This is a bell-shaped graph, which is a normal distribution. So center here is the mean, right? And then this is about, this is a 70. This is the mean value. So in the normal distribution, the characteristic here is a mean median mode. They are at the center and they are identical. That is a one of the characteristics of the normal distribution. Okay. So now we have two class. Class A and class B. There are two classes are there. Classroom A and classroom B. Let's say the students are there, right? In the different classes. So we are looking for the exam marks. The variable here is the exam marks, which is a quantitative continuous data. And then we have these two distribution is here. So the, here, the center is the mean, right? The center is the mean. The mean or the average exam marks for the class A is 70. And then the average exam marks for the class B also 70. It's the same, okay? Can I say that classroom A and classroom B, their performance is exactly the same? No. Why not? Because the dispersion is different. Yes, because the dispersion is different, right? So Sai is answering for this. So here, the dispersion is different. We cannot say that their performance is exactly the same. So we cannot always, we cannot only present the center, the mean alone. We always need to present together with the dispersion that we will understand about our data set, okay? So it will be the complete picture. If you present only the mean, it's not complete yet, right? So we are going to calculate the dispersion. So here, right? The mean is the center and the dispersion is how far the individual observation from the center, from the mean, spread out this data. So this is, we call the measure of dispersion. So here, there are two population there, population A and population B, two population. Their mean, their center is exactly the same here, but the dispersion is different. Population A is smaller dispersion and the B is a larger dispersion than A. Here, so we also always need to present the center together with the measure of dispersion. So measure of dispersion is the variation in our data set that we are looking for the how spread the data is. So there are many measures for the dispersion, right? Range, IQR, integral range, variance, ST, standard deviation, percentile, standard error, and then coefficients of variation. So in this lecture, I will focus uh, on a few of the measure of dispersion. So the first one is the range. So the range here, which is the very easy to calculate, is the difference between the smallest value and the largest value. We arrange the data set into ascending order, we make the difference. So that is the range here. In this data set, 17 minus one, 16, that's the range. But same like me, range is affected by the outliers, the extreme data, right? The another one is interquartile range. Interquartile range here is the difference between third quartile and then first quartile. So we arrange the data set into ascending order and then we divide the data set into four equal parts. 
So here IQR is the difference between third quartile and then first quartile. So we will look into the example here first, right? So here in this one, this is about the student's uh, theory, right? Exam marks, the academic performance as well. So the total, the maximum will be the 50%. That, that is the maximum possible one. So the pass is 25%, okay? So this is the 20 students, their performance here. And then we arrange into the ascending order. Minimum is 14.6 and the maximum is 44. So here the range is 29.4, right? The range is quite big. Then we will calculate Q1, Q2, and Q3. Q1 is the first quartile. This is the 25th percentile. The formula is M plus one over four. So sample size is 20. 20 plus one over four is 5.25. So 5.25 is the fifth item. One, two, three, four, five. The fifth item is 27.2. And then the another one is 0 0.25. This is the one fourth of the distance between six and the fifth item. So 0 0.25 times 27.4 minus 27.2. So this is 27.25, right? So we can say that 25% of the class their marks is lower than or equal to 27.25. The another one is Q2. Q2 is median. It's a 50 year percentile, right? So this is the M plus one over two is 20 plus one divided by two is 10.5. 10 item is 30.7. 11 item is 31.5. We make the average of these two is 31.1. So we can say that 50% of the class, their performance, their marks is lower than or equal to 31.1%. Then Q3 is three M plus one over four. So 3, 20 plus 1 divided by 4 is this a 3 fourth of the data, which is a 75th percentile. So this is the 15.75. So the 15 item is 33. But this is the 3 fourth of the distance between these two. So 0 0.75 times 33.6 minus 33.3. So this is 33.525. So that we can say that 75% of the class, their marks is lower than or equal to 33.525. Then we can calculate IQR in the quartile range. That is the difference between third quartile and the first quartile, which is 6.275, okay? So you can see that the range is quite big. Here is 14.6 to 44, but the middle 50%, the variation is very small. It's 6.275% vary only, right? In the middle 50%. So IQR is talking about the middle 50% only. It is not for the whole data set, okay? If you see the large IQR, that show that there is a large variation in the middle 50%. And if you see the small IQR, that shows that in the middle 50%, that is a small variation. So after we have the minimum value, maximum value, right? And then Q1, Q2, and Q3, then the next thing we can draw the box and whisker plot. This is, we call the five number summary, right? To describe the whole data set. Then we can draw box and whisker plot. So box and whisker plot, the first one, we draw the box using the lower quartile and then upper quartile. That is the Q1 and Q3, we draw the box. And then we divide the box using the median, okay? And then we connect with the straight line to the lower extreme to the upper extreme here. So this is the box and then this one is the whisker. So the data set, our data set here, right? So here we draw the box using Q1, which is the 27.25, and then Q3 is 33.525, and then divide the box into two parts is 31.1 is the median value. The connect straight line to the lowest value, 14.6, and the largest value is 44. So we can look at the box plot, and then we know that the range is very big one, yes, but the location of the concentration here is 27.25% to 33.525, made of 50% is quite, the narrow dispersion is there, okay? And then whether this is symmetrical data or not, we can look at the box. If the median divides the box equal uh, into two equal parts, then we can say that it will be the approximately normal distribution, right? But this one is not normal distribution, right? It will be skewed to the right. Then the next uh, measure is variance. The variance is how far the individual observation from the center, that is the mean. This is we call the variance. It's also known as a square deviation, okay? So the variance can be calculated for the sample and it can also be calculated for the population as well. Population variance we denote by using a sigma square and then the sample variance is we denote by using S square, okay? So this is the formulas for the variance. So in this one, look at the example here. So in this example, right, we randomly select the five students and then we want to know about how many hours that they study one week before exam. So here, the unit of measurement is hours. How many hours? So hours, and then the response here is 65586. The number of hours is the quantitative data. So we can calculate mean. So here the mean is six hours, right? 
So what about the variance in this data set? So the first one, the mean here in this data set is uh, six hours. So the first student study six hours, mean is six hours. It is no deviate, no variation from the mean. So X minus X bar is called deviation, which is zero. The first student study exactly six hours, exactly as a mean, no deviation. The second student study five hours, mean is six hours. So one hour less than mean, right? That is deviation. And then third student study five hour, mean is six hour. It is one hour less than mean. And then four students study eight hours, mean is six hour. It is two hours above the mean. And the last one is exactly as a mean. So no deviation from the mean. So this is X minus X bar, this is a deviation. Then we need to sum up for the whole data set. Summation of X minus X bar is always equal to zero. Zero means no deviation in the data set. But this is not true because two students study one hour less than me and the one student study two hours above the mean, right? So, so what we do, we are going to square off this uh, deviation. So this is, we call square deviation. So here zero and then one square, right? Negative one square is one and then two square is four. So then we sum up of this X minus X bar square is six. So this is for the whole data set. Now we are going to average. So six over, we are not going to divide by N. We need to divide by N minus one, which is known as the degree of the freedom to get the M bias estimate of the variance. So six over N minus one is five minus one. So it will be four, uh, four so 1.5 hours squared. So in this data, right, we understand that the average hours, right, the students study one week before the exam is six hours, but there is a variation among the students. Yes, how many hours variation? 1.5 hours squared. It is difficult to interpret because no one study hours squared, right? We study in hours only. So the units are always square in the variance. So then it's difficult to interpret. So what we do, we square root of the variance. And then what is the square root of the variance? Students? Standard deviation. Standard deviation, yes, right? If you square root of the variance, that is the standard deviation here, okay? So why we square root of the variance is difficult to interpret. So we square root of the variance and then this is a standard deviation. So in the same data set here, right? We are going to square root of 1.5 hours square and then it, it's the 1.224 hours. Now we understand that the average right, steady hours among these five students is a six hours, but there is a variation is about 1.224 hours a day. So this is the standard deviation, okay? So this is the measure of dispersion that I want to uh, focus in this lecture. So actually, right, I want to show you the SPSS data, but today my SPSS software is quite moody and then I cannot open the data set. So uh, I cannot show you this SPSS data for how to interpret for this uh, measure of uh, central tendency and the measure of dispersion. I also want to show you the screwness and then like, whether the right screw or the left screw and then like peak or the flat as well that I want to show, but today I cannot open that, okay? So, so sorry for this one. For my end, Prof. Yes. So here for the take home messages. So mean is the most widely used one and the most preferred, right? Because it is very easy to understand for, mo uh, for most of us. And then mean is calculated for the quantitative data and the median, yes, is also calculated uh, for the quantitative data, but it can also be used for the ordinal numerical data. And median is a good measure for the skew data. If it is, if you have the extreme data or the outliers, yes, we can calculate, we better calculate median. Mode can be applied to all type of the data for the dichotomous, right, polychotomous, nominal, ordinal, categorical, we can calculate mode, okay? Whenever we calculate mean, we always need to calculate together with the standard deviation. So that will get give us a complete picture, right? Central tendency and then the spread, the dispersion together. If you calculate median, right? Median is the center alone. So we need to present about the dispersion, which is the Q1 and Q3. That is the first quartile and the third quartile. So when we are reporting in a research paper, right? So we are not uh, presenting the interquartile range. So we present Q1 and Q3 value that better for many, uh, for better uh, for the audience to understand that, the readers to understand that. Okay? And also we can calculate that we can present the range as well. That is the minimum and maximum. That is for quantitative data. But for the qualitative data for the research report, right? So always we calculate frequency and the percentage. That is the absolute frequency and then relative frequency. 
So this is the end of my lecture. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Hito. Uh, very clear, good uh, presentation with many information for us. Uh, and now uh, the session is the discussion session. Uh, I invite uh, students or maybe lectures to ask directly to Profito, please. Um, Dr. Z, the future Dr. Z, please. Uh, you can ask to profit. There is no question. Hello, Dr. Burhan. Yes, okay, yes. Dr. Nining. Uh, to profit, is it right to qualify the data? Uh, is it right that? quantitative is better than qualitative data or is it right that ratio is uh, better than uh, nominal data uh, like that prof okay. uh, no because uh, when we are collecting the uh, the variables right to get the information so some of the variables will be category qualitative and then some are the quantitative data so we cannot say like let's say the qualitative is better or quantitative variables are better for this one for for i mean like for uh, judgment for this because like uh uh disease right so whether disease present or absent so this is like also like it it will give us a lot of information like how many people are having disease how many not disease how many exposed how many not exposed so it depends on that one we can also initiate at uh, the preventive and control interventions so the same thing like quantitative variable also like if you want to know about for example like uh, serum cholesterol level or the BMI also like quantitative variable and then we can know about what about the average, what about the variation in our data, in our uh, uh, population also we can understand that like uh, in the uh, like uh, the growth of the, the baby right, so we can measure the weight, we can measure the mid-arm circumference, so this one will be the quantitative variable then we can assess. So they, they have their own value so we cannot say which data, which type of the variable is better. Oh, okay, so uh, we cannot classify uh, this data at uh, uh, apa, different apa ya, degrees like that. Yeah, all all have uh, the same. Uh, yes. So depends only on like uh, when you collect right the variables. So the mm -hmm. variable is, for example, like gender. This is a category. So gender, we can okay. classify this is the dichotomous data. If you collect, let's say, like nationality. So nationality will be the uh qualitative and nominal variable so oh, if you want to uh, see, uh know about the disease severity like for example like depression right no depression my moderate severe very severe depression so that will be the ordinal variable so based on like what you collect and then we can classify what's the type so based on this type so we can select the descriptive statistic and also we can select the, the statistical test for the hypothesis testing as well Okay, okay. Thank you, Prof. Hito. You're welcome. Uh, I have a question, Prof. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yes. Um, actually, for a long time, I think about the formula of uh, standard deviation, deviation yes. standard. Why the sum of the different between uh, the observed con and mean, uh, uh, the difference between observed uh, con and mean, and then square, and then sum of them, why divided by the number of sample minus one? Why not divided by the number of sample only? Yes. <laughs> why, so I will show you this one. Yes. Uh, we will go into that, right? So this is the n minus one, which is called uh, as a degree of freedom. 
So the degree of the freedom is if you know the deviation, the, the sum of the deviation, so we can always uh, know about that n minus one number. So the last n, we can always predict that we can always understand, we can always know that what would be the value. So for example, like the previous example, the five students, the number of hours that they study. So in this one, the sum of the deviation is zero. Always it is zero. So we know the sum of the deviation here. Then, so why this, what is n minus one, right? So he, here is the sum of the deviation. So you can look at that. This one is the five, so negative one, negative one and two. So what will be this value? So this value is, if you want to get the sum of the deviation is equal to zero, this one will be zero, right? So if this one is zero, that one will be exactly as your mean. This one will be six. So this is we call degree of freedom, okay? So we will look at that. Let's see. If your data set is five, okay? So we know the sum of deviation is zero now. So the first value is, let's say I change to five. Five, 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 five. So what will be this deviation? This will, will be negative one, right? And then this one will be negative one. This is also negative one. This is also negative one. So what will be the last one? This last one will be, to get the deviation, sum of deviation zero, this one will be four. If this one is four, what is this? This one will be 10. So this is we call n minus one. If you know the sum of the deviation, we can always estimate, we can always know that, yes, what will be the last one, the nth number that we will know. This is we call degree of freedom. So in the variance formula, why we divide using n minus one, why not n? So we will look into this example. So in this example, you can see that this is the population, our big population, right? The steady population is capital N. So there are 18 people are there. This is the observation here. So I am going to select the sample, okay? So in this all 18, 18 people, the observation, the mean, the mu is 5.5. Mu is population mean. And the population standard, probably, sorry, population variance is 3.0976. So I am selecting three sample from this. So this is N3. So I take three, four, and five. I take that. So I can calculate the mean. The mean here is four. And then when I calculate the variance, if I divide by N, the variance is 0 0.6667. So this is 0 0.67. And if I divide by N minus one, the variance is larger value is one. This is N bias estimate that we call. We always, because we don't know about the population variance, we want to estimate that. So then if you want to get, get the N bias estimate, so we must divide by N minus one. If you divide by N, it is smaller. It is like underestimating the population variance. So like this one is better than this 0 0.67. So the same thing, if you, div, let, let's say you are taking the another sample of five and then uh, seven and eight, and then we calculate the variance. If you divide by N is 1.56, it is underestimating our population variance. But if you divide by N minus one, this is better estimating is 2.33. So this is, we call the N bias estimate. That's why we are dividing by N minus one in the variance. Thank you, Prof. I think actually clear, but too fast. <laughs> but never mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe, student, uh, any question? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> yes. Uh, my name Hi. is Safitri. Safitri, yes. Uh, I want to ask uh, in the lecture, we. Uh, Prof has uh, explained how to calculate the mean, median, mode, and other or others uh, on a small amount of data. And then, uh, what about uh, research that has a large amount of data? Uh, how to uh, calculate it in uh, to order me uh, to minimize calculation error? Thank you. 
uh, you mean that if we have the large amount of the data, so how to calculate mean, median, and mode? Is that? Yes. yes so if you have the large amount of the data, because this one is like uh, just an example for us to understand how to calculate mean, median, mode. So if you want to calculate for the large amount of data, for example, like your sample size is, let's say 200, 300, 400, 500, or like what's it thousands, or we can use the software, the statistical software are there, right? So the SPSS, FP Info, Starter, so this software we can use and we can calculate mean, median, and more. Thank you, Prof. Okay. Maybe the other student, any question? Mohon maaf, Dr. Murhan izin bertanya. Yes. Uh, uh, mention your name. Okay. Uh, excuse me, uh, Professor. I would like to ask a question about variable. Uh, from what you've explained before, uh, it, what it, uh, the importance in identifying variables, one of them uh, is to ensure that all the data that are relevant to the study are collected. How can we know or like um, how to uh, ensure that all the data that we have collected before uh, are relevant to the study that we are doing. Uh, yes. When you, yes, when you do your research, you have your objective, right? And then your research question. So based on the objective and the research question, so we need to identify what are the, the variables that you want to collect. So we can review the literature so based on the literature, let's say if you want to know about any of the, the risk factors for the disease, you can review the literature and then based on the literature that we can identify what are the, the variables that we are collecting, uh, we should collect and then that that's are relevant for answering your objective. Let's say you want to know about, let's say the, for example, let, uh, like uh, the factors right associated with uh, uh, systolic blood pressure. So the systolic blood pressure, what factors are associated? We can review the literature, right? Like age, gender, BMI. So these variables that we are collecting, and then we can know that we can do the association. So that these are the relevant information, relevant data. Like smoking also is associated with systolic blood pressure. Yes, we will collect that. So the the, the variables like which are not not uh, I mean not relevant. Uh, for example, like uh, nationality and then systolic blood pressure. So if you think the nationality is not relevant, then why we need to ask about this, uh, this question, okay, in our uh, uh, data. So that's like, we need to know that these questions are relevant for our study or not. For example, like student, student academic stress. So what are the factors related to the academic stress? So when you plan for the data collection, what variables that we are going to collect? So at that time, like the student's BMI, is that BMI is related to the academic stress? So that you can review the literature and then you have to justify that, whether you are going to collect this BMI, whether it is necessary for your research or not. Okay, we always need to review the literature and then based on our own observation also, we can make the judgment that whether, which data are relevant and then which variables can give answer to our research question, to our objective. Thank you very much, Professor. The other question, any question again from lecture, maybe? This topic is very uh, simple and easy to understand. So, and most of the students, I think you have already learned these topics, right? So you uh, don't have much questions about that. Uh, I have a question again, Prof. Yes. Okay. Yes, Prof. Okay. Uh, uh, mostly, uh, we summarize the data with mean. Yes, Prof. But in non, uh, not normal distribution. Yes. As it right, as it right, if we present the summarize of the data by median, or we use median 
and also use uh, to meet. Prof, thank you. For the skew data, we present median, but uh, it is also recommended in some literature said that we also uh, can present the mean as well. So then the people can justify like whether your data is normal distributed or not because in the normal distribution mean and median will be closed so we can uh, present the mean and median in the research uh, article so uh, but in the some of the uh, research paper we present only the median for example like the Leica like scale the Leica like scale data we present median and q1 and q3 only but for like BMI BMI but our data is not normal distribution but for the BMI, we can present both uh, mean and median. Uh, if we present the median, we accompany with Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q3. Or with minimum and maximum, bro. Minimum, maximum also, yes. Range also together. Okay. Thank you, bro. Thank you, sir. The other question, maybe? Any question more? Mungkin saya dokter. Oke, okay, uh, dokter Fakhri. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Professor. My name is Fahri Nawaldi. I want to ask a question about mean, median, and mode. Uh, my question is, when we calculate the mean, median, and mode, what and how it applies to our studies. I mean, what the what the interpretation of that? For example, in slide before, how many should that people have? There is one, two, even 10 like that. And we calculate that median is five like that. Uh, what the interpretation of that? Maybe that's my question, Professor. The median, sorry, the first one is mean, right? So mean is the average. So for example, let's say in a class, right? Uh, there are other students, okay? In the class, there are other students. And then if you, if let's say someone is asking you about, what about the age of this class? You cannot uh, present like the first student, this student is 20 years old, this one is 21, this one 22, this one 24. We cannot present that, that is the raw data only. So what we do is we need to summarize all this raw data to the information. Okay, so that one, we calculate, the first one is average, so the mean. So the mean, let's say is 23.5 years. So then everyone understand that yes, average of this class, average age of this class is 23.5 years. So that's the average, but there is a variation also, right? We cannot present the mean alone, right? The center alone. Always like the people, because the people, the, the students, their age are different, right? So we are different. So that variation, we need to talk together. So that's the, the average is 23.5 years, but there is a variation of age among the students. Let's say if it is 0 0.5 years, so that is 0 0.5 years. It's like half a year's variations between the students are there. So that is the mean and standard deviation. So another application for mean and ST is, Mean plus or minus 2ST is 95.4% of the data, right? That covers. So then we can say the 95.4% of the data, let's say the mean is 23.5. And then the two plus 2ST two is one year. So 24.5 years. And then minus 2ST is 23.5 minus one is 22.5. So 95% of the class is 22.5 to 24.5 years. So that the mean and ST interpretation that then we can understand that yes, this is the the percentage of the students in the class, right? That is between 22.5 to 24.5. And then the average is 23.5 years, but the variation is there, which is a half, an, half a year. Then another one is the median. Median tell you about the 50th percentile. That is the median is 50th percentile. So let's say if the median is, for example, no, the median age of the class is 22. That's mean 50% of the class that is below or equal to 22 years. 50% above 22. That's median is telling us. Okay. Mm -hmm. The mode is the most frequently occurring. So that mode is like very easy, right? 
So which age is the highest frequency? So let's say 22 is the highest frequency or 23 is the highest frequency, then that's the mode. So that's that from there we can understand about mean, median and mode and then to describe the whole data. So what is about our data? I wanna ask something again, Prof. Yes. That, for example, in slide before about that shoes people have, uh, that we we calculate that average or mean is five like that. Or can we conclude that every person has five shoes, Prof? No. Like that? The mean is average only because there is variation, right? Yes. Mean is only the center. It's not about the spread. So we cannot say that average, yes, but not everyone is five. The average is five, but the variation also, always we need to talk together, okay? Okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you for the question. Maybe the others? Any question more? Okay, enough from Malaysian student, maybe. Malaka Manipal students, are you here? From lecture, enough? Ah, uh, okay. Any questions? No problem. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Hito, uh, with uh, your presentation. Very good, clear uh, the presentation. Insyaallah, uh, many information and knowledge uh, for us uh, here. And maybe closing statement from Prof. Hito for us. Please, Prof. Hito, maybe closing statement. Uh, thank you so much. It, no other questions, uh, the students? No, okay, no other questions. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Prof. And then thank you very, uh, very much, uh, the University Muhammadiyah Sukar, uh, Sukaraja. Yes. Yes. Yes, for inviting us um, for this uh, lecture series. We are very happy to share uh, our knowledge uh, with the students. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Hito. And thank you to all questioners. And finally, we come to the last session of this lecture. Uh, Excuse me, Dr. Burhan. Dr. Nining, you? Yes. Because this is, is our last session in the last uh, lecture series. Yes. We have a picture together and to all participants, especially from MMMC. Okay. <laughs> to uh, activate the um, camera the and then I will take the picture. Is the it, uh, yes. Maybe uh, the presentation uh i mean uh share screen maybe <laughs> can be stop <laughs> can i uh shall i stop sharing the screen yes okay yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay uh okay profito we record uh this presentation and can we share it to our uh youtube channel prof yes please uh you can share that yes Okay. Okay, I will take the picture. Okay. One. Two. Enough. Okay, enough, Dr. Burhan. Yes, thank you, Dr. Nining.
Thank you very much for Prof. Ito and thank you to all the participants for joining the seminar. And hopefully uh, the lecture today would be useful to all uh, of us and uh, we uh, blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thank you for your attention. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, to all participants, don't forget to fill in the uh, G form uh, to get the certificate of attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Profito. Thank you. Thank you, Profito. Prof, good. Good morning. <laughs> Still good morning. <laughs> yeah. See you next time, Prof. Hito. <laughs> See you again. See you again. <laughs> See you. Dr. Yusuf Oke, eh, maaf Pak <laughs> Saya Sabi Mohonnya sudah selesai <laughs> ah, Oke okay. Terima kasih semuanya adik-adik Terima kasih Pak. semuanya Bisa. Terima kasih juga Pertanyaan-pertanyaannya Bagus okay. Saya izin pamit Pak Bidan Oke Oke, yeah, monggo. Saya tak jadi petir. Assalamualaikum. Kembali di N. Putina. Assalamualaikum semua.